So now we know how to identify the key anatomy in the abdo X-ray. We can proceed to look at how we analyze it. The main thing is that we're systematic in our approach. And we can break down the three key steps into undertaking a general check, analyzing the quality of the image, and finally, looking at the anatomy and trying to identify any abnormalities. Starting with the general check, we want to clarify the patient's age, sex, and also what's the history of the patient. So basically, what's the reason for us performing the abdominal x-ray in the first place? Then, we want to check the type of view we've used. So is it AP, or is it very rarely a PA or lateral decubitus? And lastly in the general check, we want to see if this has been an erect abdominal x-ray, or if the patient is lying supine. When analysing the image to ensure it's good enough quality, the key things we want to look for are firstly, if the whole of the abdomen is covered in the image itself, and also, if the image is correctly penetrated. In terms of coverage, in an AP view, we want to make sure that the image covers from the base of the lung superiorly, to the proximal part of the femur inferiorly, and also that it incorporates the lateral aspects of the abdomen. With regards to seeing if the image is adequately penetrated or not, we can tell this by looking for the presence of the vertebral column and the pelvis that's visible posterior to the abdominal content. And in X-ray images that we can't see these bony structures, it's a good indicator that the image may be underpenetrated. So we're happy with the general check and the quality of the abdominal x-ray. We can now begin our systematic approach for identifying abnormalities. Now, there are lots of different ways that we can approach an abdominal x-ray. And if you have one technique which you find works for you and covers all the key points, then very much feel happy to continue using that one. However, the surgical teaching approach uses the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E. A stands for arteries, B is bowels, C is calcium, so bones and stones, D is dense organs, and E is escaped air. Starting with arteries. Now normally, we shouldn't be able to see any abdominal arteries or the aorta. So when we can, it's usually because their walls are heavily calcified, or the arteries may be aneurysmal. The main vessels we should be looking for to see these abnormalities are the abdominal aorta, the renal arteries, or the splenic, iliac, and femoral arteries. Moving on to B and bowels, we can look at the stomach, the small and large bowel, and also the rectum. The main things that we're looking for are evidence of bowel obstruction which in the case of small bowel would be suggested by a bowel lumen that's greater than 3 cm in diameter. And for the large bowel, obstruction would be indicated by a large bowel diameter that's greater than 6 cm. But in the case of the cecum, which is naturally larger in size, this would need to be distended to a diameter of greater than 9 cm. We call this the 369 rule, and it's really important to remember when looking at abdominal x-rays in any patient who has a suspicion of intestinal obstruction. The other things that we can look for, which are related to the bowel or GI tract, are acute gastric dilatation, which may need relieving by an NG tube, a sigmoid volvulus, which will be evident through its characteristic coffee bean appearance, and also the presence of faeces in a patient who may present with constipation. Moving on to C, so calcium. This mainly involves assessing for the presence of any calcified urinary tract stones within the renal pelvis, along the course of the ureters, or within the urinary bladder itself. And also, we can look to see if there are any calcified gallstones that may be present, either in the gallbladder, or in the case of the gallstone ileus, whether a large stone has become lodged within the terminal ileum. As well as stones, we should also be assessing the bony structures, and in turn, the muscles that are visible on abdominal x-rays 
to ensure that we don't miss any obvious injuries or significant pathology. Moving on to D, or dense structures, we basically want to assess the more solid intra-abdominal organs, including the liver, gallbladder, spleen, kidneys, and urinary bladder. Now typically, we wouldn't expect to be able to see these organs in a great amount of detail, let alone notice any subtle abnormalities. But, in rare instances, we may be able to identify more obvious issues, such as hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, or a grossly distended urinary bladder in a person who may have urinary tract obstruction. Lastly in our mnemonic is E, which stands for escaped air. The medical term for this is pneumoperitoneum, and it's basically when there is free air that's present outside of the GI tract, which is typically an indication that there's been a perforation. Whilst pneumoperitoneum and free air is often easier to see when looking for air underneath the diaphragm on an erect chest x-ray, we can also see signs of it on the abdominal x-ray. The most common sign to look for is Rigler's sign. This is when both the luminal surface of the bowel and the outer or serosal surfaces are easy to see due to the presence of free air and gas which increases the contrast around the bowel serosa. Now in a normal abdominal x-ray, we shouldn't really be able to see the outer serosal layer because of a lack of contrast. So when we can see it, it's a good indicator that air has escaped and is acting as a contrast agent. Whilst being confident in spotting signs like Wrigler's takes a while to achieve, just being in the habit of looking for it and being systematic in our approach to abdominal x-rays is really helpful. And over time, you'll increase your skills and confidence in doing so. And finally, once we've completed our A, B, C, D, E approach, it's important that we take a step back, summarise our findings, and give our impression. So basically, what do we think is going on, and what's our diagnosis? So to summarise what we've covered in this tutorial series on abdominal x-rays, abdominal x-rays are a very commonly used first-line investigation. There are several indications for performing abdominal x-rays, including acute abdominal pain, and also when there's a suspicion of intestinal obstruction. In the vast majority of cases, abdominal x-rays are performed using the anterior-posterior view. However, in rare instances, they may be performed using the posterior-anterior and the lateral decubitus view. When we analyse and interpret abdominal x-rays, it's important that we apply a systematic approach. And one such approach to use is our ABCDE approach, which we looked at in some detail. And lastly, don't worry if you find abdominal x-rays a bit confusing or daunting when first starting off, because the more you practice and the more you use this systematic approach, the easier it becomes and the more confident you'll feel.